All right, it's my real pleasure to talk today to Matt Lisfetter, and we're going to talk about his book, Algorithmic Desire. And I think one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, I've, I've read the book pretty carefully, is where you get the title Algorithmic Desire and what that means to you. Because that I, 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 I can see it, I guess, as I'm reading through the book, but it, it, I, I still think there's ways in which it's it's still obscure to me. So if you could just clarify for me, that would be helpful. Yeah, no, thanks, Todd. That's a really, really good question. Um, so there's a couple of things. I mean, the, the first thing, I mean, the, the, the desire part of it is obvious. I think that when I started working on social media, um, I was really trying to use social media as kind of a way to really grapple with and understand the contemporary relevance of Lacan in particular, um, Zizek's work, um, the way that we can use psychoanalysis uh, to understand questions of ideology uh, and subjectivity. So the desire part of it, I think, is um, pretty obvious there. When I, The more I was studying social media, I was thinking about how do algorithms really come to um, play a role in maintaining uh, a base of users, uh, an audience, or people that are actually engaged with social media. So in... And there's there's a section in the book, too, where I'm kind of revisiting the work of Stuart Hall in media theory and his encoding decoding model. And the more I was and I was teaching it at the same time, too. And the more I was thinking about the encoding decoding model, the more I was thinking about how it really had to be updated for thinking about the age of social media and algorithmic new media. And I think that the best way to update it is to think about how algorithms are written to find ways to keep us engaged, active, using for more time that we might do so normally. So I kind of started thinking about how, you know, what if, what if it is the case that what algorithms are actually learning about and doing with user information and data is finding ways to play around with our desire to create a kind of a lure for us um, at the level of our desire and uh, maybe, you know, you know, keeping it, you know, at a distance to right. keeping us. So not that it knows what we desire, it knows how to keep it away from us. Um, well, that, so that, that made to, me think, I, I, that makes a lot of sense to me, but it, that makes me wonder why you didn't call it algorithmic fantasy. Like I, that's what I was, I was reading it. I kind of wondered why I'm sure you had this thought, like, well, I'm going to choose algorithmic desire rather than algorithmic fantasy. I just was curious why. So, okay, so I mean, there's a couple of, I mean, to be honest, too, there were a few, and I put it in the epigraphs to the book, and I, I, I have them in front of me, so I just want to read them, and I kind of, yeah. when I read these, I'm like, oh my god, these, you know, this sounds like a great way to think about algorithmic media. So the first one is Roland Bout, who says, the first thing that power imposes is a rhythm, and when I was initially pitching the title of the book, I want to actually say that I initially pitched it as uh, hashtag rhythmic desire. I was thinking about the rhythm of the desire in the media. Of course, when I pitched that, you know, they said nobody's going to understand what that means. So I'm okay, fine. I switched to the algorithm. But that whole about quote was the first thing I was thinking about. That the first thing the power imposes is a rhythm. Then there's a, a quote from Deleuze and Guattari: uh, "Everything moves to the rhythm of one and the same desire." So that was more of the. And right. then you know, my at the time I started working on this, my daughter was listening to a lot of uh, Katy Perry. And that song, Chain to the Rhythm, came out. And, I, you know, okay, that was sort of the, the clincher. And the whole, if you watch the video, and I do an ex, I did an exercise with a, a class I teach on popular culture where you watch Katy Perry's video for Chain to the Rhythm. And the whole thing is about how everybody is glued to their devices, right, that were chained to the rhythm of the media. So I think all of those things together is so really kind you, of how I came up with that. For you, algorithm and rhythm are that those two are they're working together right every algorithm is into it has a rhythm that it's trying to evoke right or or to keep going i think that, i mean i th i think that's a good way good way to put it i think that i mean now what we mean you know what is the rhythm here i think that um you know every medium if you think about you know even in film language right you know the cut and count you know every Every medium sort of plays on its own rhythm, its own uh, um, um, tempo, if you will. So I think that that's another way to think about the, the social media algorithm, um, what it's imposing there. I mean, do you think it's a, I guess one question that, that ran through my reading was, to what extent do you think this is a radical change, like in the structure of desire? I think, I mean, it, 
I don't know that you ever really say that directly, but I, w- I just wondered if that's subtending everything that you say. Like it's the, the point is really, look, something really radical changes with the introduction of the algorithm or were there something like algorithms functioning in the 19th century? You know what I mean? Like, like not that per yeah. se, but something standing. For no, that. I, I think that's a, I think that's a really good question. And I guess I wouldn't say that there's a radical change um, specific, you know, in the, in, in the style of, of uh, algorithmic media, but I, I remember, so I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm an orthodox admirer of the media theorist Lev Manovich, but he has a really interesting way of describing what he means by new media in a book he wrote called The Language of New Media. It's about 20 years old now. Mm. And he says we can understand new media as the combination of an interface with a database. Now, one of the reasons why I like that description is because he kind of shows that with every new medium, we can then retroactively rethink our understanding of older media. So, for instance, um, I'm going to tap into a little bit of, you know, Canadian communication theory okay. right here. So the work of Harold Ennis, right? So Harold Ennis is, uh, famously is a political economist, but thinking about um, um, different historical moments in terms of the dominant medium of each particular moment. So if you go back to, you know, the stone tablet, let's say, right? Okay. If you think about the stone tablet as a medium of communication, you can think about how both it's, it is both at the same time an interface and a database, because it's an interface in the way that the, the text is directly written onto it, but it's also a database as a, as a way of storing and holding right. onto the information that's contained there. So what I think is important here is that with every new medium, it's not necessarily radically changing and creating something new, but it allows us a a way to think about all previous media that come prior. So when we think about algorithmic media and social media in particular, and I think one of the way, one of the reasons I start the book with this idea of metaphor is that, uh, and I'm drawing a little bit off of Neil Postman's, uh, you know, right. Playing off of Mark yeah, you cite him quite a bit, actually. I, 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 I thought that was good. Like, I think that he has something to say. Yeah. So, uh, so I think that, I mean, if we look at it that way, we can think about how every new medium is a representation or a metaphor for the dominant form of consciousness at a given particular historical moment. That then retroactively allows us to rethink all things that happened prior. Right. I mean, it's kind of like Marx's idea that the anatomy of the human is the is the key to the anatomy of the ape, not yeah. vice versa. Right. Like, I think that that seems to me like such an important idea. And it's wrapped up even in this Freudian idea of noctreglicite. Right. Like this, that you have to read it backwards. I really like that, that the the birth of the algorithm reveals the way in which this form has been that the, the importance of form operative in relation to desire earlier. Now, that leads me to this next question, actually. Like, so you make this differentiation between old and new structuralism. And so could you say the same thing about structuralism? Could you say that there's this new emergence that has actually clarified what's at stake? First of all, maybe you could say what you see is the difference between old and new structuralism. Sure. But then could you say the same thing? Like, the, the new this new form of structuralism actually clarifies something that was operative for old structuralism that it the the the, the practitioners Levi Strauss or Sir they didn't they weren't aware of. Yeah, I think that's actually a really good question. I don't know if I would agree that the new structuralism that I'm trying to describe clarifies um something about old structural structuralism but i actually think that there's a new way of thinking in terms of structure that is developed in the uh the work of zizek and dolar and dupanjic and others who have been influenced um, um by the the slovenian school uh of lacan and german idealism um but I'll, I'll say quickly that one of the things that i wanted to do with the book in talking about a new structuralism was right now very much in vogue, especially in, at least in Canadian communication theory, new materialism, but a new materialism that's very much influenced by Deleuze. Uh, Deleuze and Foucault are sort of the, the touching points of so much communication theory and in, in my national context in Canadian communication theory. So part of what I wanted to do here, and, and I don't see it as much in contemporary media studies, especially in internet and social media studies, I don't see as much work being done 
on Lacan, or even going back to some of the Marxist structuralism influenced by Louis Althusser. So part of the, the idea here was to try to bring back a, a kind of a structuralist and even a dialectical way of thinking about media that I think is really sort of evaporated in a lot of recent scholarship. But I was also going to say that I think that there's a major difference between yeah. what I'm calling a new structuralism um, influenced by the, the I, I don't like to call them neo lacadians but I, I'll say that as a, uh, for the sake of brevity. I think that the major difference has to do with the way that they conceive the role of the subject um, within the structure, in the sense that for Levi Strauss, for instance, the whole the whole concept, you know, the the idea, what does he say in um, Savage Mind, that the whole project is to dissolve man, right? To dissolve right. the idea of the subject. The same thing with Althusser, that Althusser, the subject is a mere function of ideology, that right. we have to think history without subject or goal. So what I'm trying to do here is to bring back the position of the the subject within the structure, and I think that that's an important thing to add when we're thinking about the ideology of social media. Yeah, yeah. So that that's really good because it's clear. I mean, that's the whole struggle between or, or quarrel between Levi Strauss and Sartre is over subjectivity, right? Um, but Sartre is kind of blind to the role that structure plays. So there's a there's a kind of a which is what, what's important about Lacan, I think. And and but it's interesting. How do you see? Because you mentioned dialectics. So how do you see the relationship between dialectic and structure or structuralism, because I was wondering, would you call Foucault, sorry, you wouldn't, that was a terrible slip on my part, because you'll know, when you hear what I meant to say, you'll think that was just terrible. What I was going to say is, would you call Hegel a structuralist? And I think maybe, but I don't know if, I mean, I, I think, because there I think Hegel brings, there may be some tension between dialectic and structure in Hegel. So I wonder what, how do you think that relationship between structure and dialectic structuralism and dialectical thought? That's actually a really good question. And I don't know if I get to it fully in, in this book, but it's definitely something that I'm paying a lot of attention to in, in my current things that I'm currently working on. And I, it's a difficult question because I think that there's a lot of slippage between talking about structure, talking about form, and I think that if if look if you look at it carefully, you could say that there's a kind of a, in in the in the movement from uh, from from Kant to Hegel, you can say that there's a kind of there is a kind of a movement from structure to subject in the way that I'm talking about here. If you think of even if you think in terms of you know the uh, uh, Hegel in terms of a, of system. Right. Or even, you know, I'll, I'll be a little bit even more reductive. There's, uh, you know, at the beginning of the greater logic, when he's talking about a true infinity and thinking about the whole form of the, you know, of the, the bad infinity as like a straight line that goes on forever, whereas the true infinity, you know, turns back in a circle. And right. I think even if you think about it in terms of, you know, that movement from positing to external to determinant reflection, or even the logic of judgment, if you go from you know, positive to negative to infinite judgment or the negation of the negation, that there's this you know, structure here, but it's at the end of the structure, or it's the, at the end of that cycle that you find the subject, right? In, in phenomenology, uh, 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 the, you know, the, you know, not only a substance, but also a subject. It's only in going through that entire structure that at the end we find the subject. So again, I, I'm being reductive here for the sake of brevity, but I think that if drawn out, we could start to think, or even in the form of consciousness, right? That the limits to the form of, the, the limits to our logic are contained in the very form of our thinking. I right. think that if you do it carefully, you can kind of you know, develop that further. Yeah, that's really good. I, I think that it's, it's interesting to me because I think that there is, I think you're right to see the way in which the relation works both ways. So there, there, that every structure occasions a dialectical movement because of the space of subjectivity that it can't include, and then every dialectical movement itself creates another structural totality, right? That it then has to, that then has to, it has its own point of contradiction that then creates something else. I, I think that that's, I mean, that seems to be really good, and I. I wonder to the extent you don't really talk about this in the book, but I wonder to the extent to which the 
algorithm is an attempt to avoid that totality. And then that that this is re related to this larger question. And this is what is most interesting to me. So you said this thing that I think most people on the street wouldn't agree with that capitalism makes us antisocial, right? And so I wonder about that. Like, is the algorithm part of this inability to see the whole and is seeing the whole what it means to be sociable or to see the like, I mean, we were talking before we started to record about um, vaccines, right? Like the whole anti-vaccine movement seems to be, to me, a species of this capitalist particularism, right? Like I, 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 I can't, I'm, I'm an isolated monad. I don't see my connection to the whole. And I wonder, I, I mean, I assume you'll say yes, that that's an example of the way capital makes us antisocial. But my, my deeper question is, what's the relationship between algorithmic desire and this antisociality of capital? Because that it seems like the algorithmic desire is occasioned by social media and is social media seems to be social, right? Like, right? yeah. I mean, in a, in a way it's, you know, it's a, it's a rhetorical conundrum. And I mean, even going back to that question about, you know, structuralism and dialectic, and I think about the, the significance of imminent critique here, because I think that when we hear the term social media, for instance, we imagine that it's going to be this, you know, holistic or harmonious, um, you know, thriving utopian digital public sphere that we were promised in the internet of the 1990s. But so much of the criticism of social media is that, well, no, it's not doing that. I mean, it's actually, you know, it's collecting big data that's used to manipulate us. It's, you know, the kind of, you know, surveillance capitalism. I, ab I actually really hate that term, uh, the Shoshana Zuboff um, surveillance capitalism, because what I think it does, it just shifts all of the attention on to surveillance and takes attention away from capitalism. And I don't think we could actually imagine capitalism ever not having surveillance. I mean, even if you think about, you know, the, 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 you know, the factory floor and the way in which workers, you know, even, you know, the time card, the punch card, you know, the, the Charlie Chaplin modern times Type of right. thing is a great example well, of that. Well, doesn't it doesn't it depend? Uh, that's a great point, and I I I, I want to think about that because maybe I don't I disagree. So, what it, doesn't it depend on what you mean by surveillance, right? Because isn't the capitalist ideal? No, we don't even need to survey because that person is surveying her themselves, right? Like that 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 is the. That, so, so I think that the, the, the capitalist ideal is actually a society where there's no more surveillance necessary because everyone is so committed to the project of, of self-surveillance. Okay, so you've opened up some, you know, a Good. bunch of can of worms, and there's a, there's a few threads that I want to kind of tie up before I yeah. get to that. Because I think it's a really, really good question yeah. um, that you're asking. I mean, so I just want to go back to this idea of capitalism and social and anti-social. And I think that the imminent critique here, and this is why I defend sticking with the, the metaphor or the, the, the idea of social media, is because I think that it's only against this idealized notion of social media that we can really register the betrayals of I the see. social, right. right, that, you know, that occurs, you know, through the, uh, the, 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 the forms of um, manipulation that takes place on, on the platform. And I think that a good way to think about it is even, I guess, through the, you know, the, the idea of, uh, of concrete and abstract universality, right? Not so not, so you say totality um, and the idea of a social. And I think what's important is that, cap yes, I mean, in, even in the, in the market form, capital is always dependent on the social, even while it is um, enjoining us to act as individuals disavowing or discarding the social that we rely upon. So this ideal of capitalism that we're supposed to be individuals, and I talk about this a little bit, the chapter on Foucault and biopolitics and neoliberalism, right. that we're encouraged to be these individual entrepreneurs of self, this individual, you know, I, you know, um, the business of one. Sure, that's the ideal, right? And that's, but I think that that's something that, you know, you know forgive me, you know, for you know talking, you know, in, in typical sound bites, but I mean that's the the sort of the false consciousness, and, and I hate you know talking about that directly, but it's the the you know there's a difference between the ideal that capitalism says it's trying to achieve and the reality of the fact that it it still depends upon 
you know, the, the social connectivity between people without which, without division, social division of labor, you couldn't have a functioning society. Yeah, I, I wonder if that's not, you know, I mean, the, like for Marx, right, the fundamental, I think he's right about this, that the fundamental contradiction of capital is that it can't be universal, right? Like that it, that it's stuck, like that, 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 that it's move to universality is always a move, a striving toward universality and never arriving at it. And exactly in the way that you just said, like it, so, so the, if I'm a particular capitalist, right? Like I want to pay my workers as little as I can. But, but you want every other capitalist. Every, exactly, exactly. Yeah. I want every other capitalist to pay their workers as much as they can so that my, so that my products can, so it's really this contradiction between the production of surplus value and the realization of surplus value right. that I think is really what you're talking about. Like that's the real contradiction. So on the one hand, you view yourself totally as a particular, but then when you're thinking about the realization of surplus value, you think in terms of universality. And so that, it seems like to me, you know, it's funny because Marx, it's, it drops out of capital. He only specifies it in the Grundrisse. So it's really weird that he'd ever, like when he's writing out capital, he like drops out, which I think is like the whole fundamental point. You know, like the real, to me, the real crux of this, that cap, the real crux of the critique of capital is this failed universality. And I think just like what your book shows is it's also a failed sociality. And I wonder, I, so I think that's really, I think that's superb. And, I, and then I also really liked I'm going to fold some questions in together. I also really, so you could pick up whatever you want. I also sure. really liked the way you rehearsed this uh, conflict between, or, or not conflict, but just core uh, of theoretical dispute between Jody Dean and, and Slavoj Žižek. So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and then, sh and then talk about where you end up, because I think it's so important for thinking about algorithm and social media in general, this, this, this dispute theoretical uh, at odds that they had with each other. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a really good question. And I mean, you're kind of getting to some of the, you know, the, my earliest thinking about social media in this way was, of course, influenced by Jody's work on communicative capitalism, which I think is a, I, I think the communicative capitalism, um, you know, I, I could have to take back what I said about surveillance capitalism for a second. Right. But I think that it's a good way because I think that what but I think the difference is I think that what uh, Jody's work on communicative capitalism actually does is it shows that capitalism is still integrated into communications. So I think that the emphasis still does come back to to capitalism and the idea of communicative capitalism. So I think that that's actually a very good description for what's happened in you know the so-called Web 2.0 period. You know, and then, you know, the shift to social networking and social media and platform capitalism, what we call it today. I think that it's a good description. I guess where I disagree with the way she's theorized communicative capitalism has to do with this, this idea. And she picks up from uh, Zizek in The Ticklish Subject. There's this little section near the end of the book where he talks about the demise of symbolic efficiency. And I have always kind of interpreted that in parallel with the way that Frederick Jameson takes up Lacan in his early postmodernism work. He talks about um, the idea of postmodernism through the breakdown of the signifying chain. And so I think that there's correlation between those two formulas. When Zizek talks about demise of symbolic efficiency as the supposed post-ideological period, I see that as somewhat similar to even the way that Jameson talks about postmodernism in the sort of Lyotard uh, formula of the incredulity towards meta narratives. Right. That the idea is we're no longer allowed to have these big grand narratives or grand theories that can give us some kind of uh, what Jameson called cognitive mapping. So some sort of big narrative that is universal that helps us to position ourselves within our spatial and historical um, setting, right? I think that that's the problem of postmodernism, that we sort of, you know, dis become discombobulated. And I think that also correlates with what uh, in Lacan, as Zizek takes it up, is described as this, this idea that nobody believes any longer in the existence of the big other. And I see that these are all different threads that tie into the problem of postmodernism and specifically postmodern capitalism. Now, in Dean, I think the idea there is taken far too literally that nobody believes any longer uh, in the big other. And I think that there is a, a better formulation in the way that Zizek, the title of one of the chapters in Piglet's Subject, 
says that it, um, why perversion is not subversion. And I think that ties into this idea of the, the ideological logic of fetishism disavowal. So it's not just that, you know, nobody believes any longer in the big other, but we actually disavow our actual belief in the big right. other. So we right. can act as rationalists, you know, uh, enlightened um, people acting in the world. You know, I, you know, I don't believe. But I think that the problem here is that it's not just disavowal of belief of our own belief in the big other. There's a disavowal in the belief of everyone else uh, in the big other. So I, I don't know whether or not you uh, you know, Utah believe in the big other or not. You don't know if I do. So I kind of have to still kind of maintain appearances. But I think in that way, and I think that it also relates to the logic of fantasy here, where I think that, um, you know, belief in the big other is still tied into the, the fact that we haven't yet traversed the fantasy, that we're still locked in by our desire. I think that for, for Jody, um, the, the issue here is that ideology works via drive rather than desire. So that for her, the critique of ideology is not so much about trying to think the traversal of the fantasy. From her perspective, I think that, you know, everyone has already traversed fantasy and that ideology is operated through drive. And I disagree with that. And I think that social media and the way that, especially when we're using social media and we can be enlightened individual, entrepreneurial even, curating our identities for the network, the symbolic network of people out there, I think that we're still demonstrating the way in which we are interpolated through the form of our desire and through the form of fantasy where enjoyment actually takes place, but that gets kind of kind of thrown out. So I, I know that I've said a lot here, but I think- No, no, that's good. Is, yeah, that. I like that a lot. And and so, so for Slavoj, it's drive that then is still, there's a kind of radicality still attached to drive that for Jody, sorry, I know both these people, I'm not just calling them, but they're, no, yeah, it's, it's, it strikes me as, as pretentious when people, but it, it, I can't, I'm caught between this, do I want to sound pretentious or do I want to sound awkward to myself? And I, I can't. I'm I, doing I choose, the same thing, so you can blame me. I choose pretension. So, um, so, so I think that like for Jody, like reconstituting desire is the radical act, right? Like I think, and, and, and I think, for, so it's a really, it's interesting because I think there are a lot of political stakes that were, I mean, she's a really active politically in a way. I think Slavoj would admittedly say that he's not. Um, yeah, I would agree. But, but he, I think, the, so the, the, but the question is just theoretical. So I, 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 I think that his idea, right, is that it's still, there's still a radicality attached to drive. And that, that's, see, I, I wonder can I, I can, I, can, I, can I pitch something yeah. here? Okay, so I think, I agree with you. I think, that, I mean, it is a theoretically esoteric point. And I think that if you get into real, you know, sort of um, activism, you don't, you know, these are sort of things that fall by the wayside. No, but, but I think, I, wait, I, but, but, no, 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 yeah. no, but hold on, yeah. sorry. I, I, sorry, I, 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 gotta, I gotta make a point here. Because I think that the difference is understanding how we understand our subjective freedom. And I think that a lot of it has to do with this movement to try to transgress limits rather than, you know, in the form of what we call the traversal of the fantasy, realizing that we have the power to impose our own limits. And I think that that's something ethically that gets lost in thinking that we've already traversed the fantasy, that ideology is a matter of drive rather than desire. Well, I, I would just say, I think that's great. I totally agree with that. And I would just say that's the problem with the whole ethic of desire that Lacan develops in Seminar 7. And I think that's why Slavoj Moore has this idea of an ethic of drive. It's, I mean, not more. like it's clear that that's what he's trying to constitute. And I think you're exactly right to say it's about the self-limitation of, of the subject as the ethical position. I mean, that comes from Kant, obviously, through the moral law, but then even through Hegel, I think that's still, if, if you can say there's a Hegelian. Can I, can I pitch something to you, though, on this idea of the ethic of desire? So what is it, you know, so uh, don't give way to your desire or whatever. Yeah. Translation. The only thing you can be guilty of is having given ground. Give away to your desire. OK, so I, I, I actually think that that's worth preserving. And I think it's worth preserving because, again, if you look at the structure of um, phenomenology of spirit, I mean, is it the whole point that you don't actually reach that understanding of the, the the fact that you're constantly trying to tr transgress the limit until you've reached that point of absolute knowing where you finally start to realize I can't transgress any further. I have to keep following that logic of my desire until I get that realization that I that I cannot 
that I cannot pause, that I'm the one who's imposing the limit ultimately. And it's only by following the law. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's constant, you know, the constant saying, act of that's not it, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it. Finally, and finally realizing I'm the one who is sort of like putting the, you know, the thing behind the curtain. I mean, that's a that, that's interesting because it's a little, it's close to what Alenka thinks in Ethics of the Real. She basically says, you know, the ethic of desire actually turns into an ethic of drive through, if you follow it to a certain, to an end point. And so I think that makes a lot of sense to me. I guess here's the here's what I would say. The only thing I would say about that, I think that I think that the problem is that Lacan, and I, I think it's evident that that it, in fact he even says it. Like there's the, o- the only Jewish. This is seminar seven, the ethics seminar. What we're talking about. The only jouissance is the jouissance of transgression, right? And and I simply think that is utterly false and utterly misleading. And I think. As long as you're caught, and this is, bears on what you're saying, and I think it bears on directly on actual political activity, so I don't think it's superfluous at all, that this, this, this leftist apotheosis of transgression and resistance, I think is deadly. And I think, it, I, I think it emanates out of that ethics of desire. And I think the, the, the reason why that, that I think that, that I, okay, I accept that enjoyment only takes por- place at the point of contradiction of a, of a certain symbolic structure, right? Like that's what lo- why love is enjoyable, right? Because if you're at the point of contradiction and, and, that, and you're experiencing something that can't be brought into the realm of sense, right? Okay, I accept that, but that doesn't, that's not, that point of transcendence is not transgressive. I think that, that I think the, the confusion between transgression and, transcendence in terms of enjoyment is a, is deadly. And I think that's caught up in this ethic of desire. So that's all I would say about that. I, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I mean, there's very little that I disagree with on that. And I actually think that that's sort of the, uh, one of the major conundrums of the left. I think that there is sort of this attachment to the enjoyment of transgression. But I'm not ready, I guess, to say that I disagree with the fact, this idea that jouissance is only in transgression. If we think about, maybe you'll disagree, but if we think that enjoyment is only in the fantasy, so that it's in the fantasy, so when I realize that I impose my own limit and I can enjoy in the fantasy of the transgression as opposed to a material transgression. So take the stupid example of a love affair, right? So I choose, so, you know, I have the fantasy of going out and having, you know, so many affairs with all these women, but oh, I couldn't because I have, you know, my partner, right? Or whatever, right? So you go out and of course, it's never as good as you think it's going to be. But then when you acknowledge that the enjoyment only is in the fantasy of the transgression, then you start to understand that the, the, the kind of freedom that you have in actually choosing the limit you impose on yourself. And I think that that's something that the left is missing. I think that's something that, you know, it, that shows that the left has not traversed the fantasy. Right, right, right. No, I agree with that. I, I, don't, I don't disagree. The only thing I would say is there are, real, I, I think there are real moments of transcendence that aren't phantasmatic. That's what I think. Like, like, that, that, like, uh, like Muhammad Ali beating George Foreman. It's transcendent. Like it couldn't happen and it happened. Okay. You know what I'm I saying? I see what you're saying. Like yeah, the yeah, storming yeah. of the Bastille, it couldn't happen. Like, is it a revolt? Louis the Sixteenth says he goes, "No, Sarah, uh, no, 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 Your Majesty, it's a revolution, right?" Like that, the, like the, 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 the impossible happens, and so I think yeah. not. I mean, fueled by fantasy, sure. Yeah, I agree, but I still think the impossible can happen, and that moment of impossibility is, I think. It, it shouldn't be just theorized as a transgression. I just don't think it should. I think it should be. No, I, I see what you're saying now, and I totally agree with you. OK, OK. All right. Let's let's go on, because I, I, I think it's really great so far. So uh, so let's I just want to say that this is accomplishing my mission, because I say I'm writing a book about social media. And here we are talking about Lacan and Marx and all of the. That's good, fields. because this is you know why this had to happen, because. The amount I know about social media is can be squeezed between my I want to say though, you know, you you have the, the best possible strategy of being on social media without being on social media. 
because it's a pure monologue and I love it. I know, I know, I know. You said that to me and I, I was going to bring that up because, but it makes me feel bad. So I, but, but yeah, that I, I'm not, I, I, I'm in the two forms of social media that allow no dialogue whatsoever. So, although I do respond to people, so I, 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 add a I, little, I, I know that you, you, you're, you're very, you and Ryan are very kind to respond to my crappy emails. It, that I, it's okay. under control though. Like it's still, I could choose okay. not to respond anyway. But that's a good, it's a good point. So, so you, you, you twice say this at different points. And so it must be important. You say that, that social media is conducive to cynicism. And I wonder why that is. And I wonder if it inheres in social media or if it's something about the particular way that it gets mobilized today because you do say it twice so I'm, I'm i'm just curious why you why you think that why it's a cynical why it's why social media has this tie to cynicism you have to okay so uh i'm gonna play guilty here and you have to remind me the con like where i say this and what i said it uh okay I, I, I have so so yeah i know your book is big so so uh uh let's just because, say yeah go ahead no, no, because do I say that social media is, or do I say that it, because, so I'll, I'll just, I'll just try to answer the no, question. You don't say, I, what you say is it's conducive to it. That's what you say. So I think, okay, so I, I want to try to, to, going off the point that I, I totally forget every single thing that I said there, yeah, I'll yeah, tell yeah. you what I, what I, what I, what I spontaneously think. And I, I guess Part, a lot of what I'm trying to do in the book is to demonstrate that the form that social media currently takes is a reproduction of the form of the the big other, the form of the of the symbolic. And I think that there's, I think that, I, I would argue that very much we're still in the historical moment of postmodern capitalism. And I think that, and here I disagree. Can you unpack that a little bit, Matt? Like, what what does that mean to you, postmodern capitalism? Postmodern capitalism. Okay, yeah. so I'll explain. So I think um, at the there's a lot that could be said, but I think that ideologically, I think that it's important to distinguish between, let's say, uh, a modern form of capital or the or the culture of uh, of uh, I'm, I'm saying modernism as the cultural form and postmodernism as the cultural form. So as you mean cultural to form? You don't mean okay. the actual structure of 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 Capitalist as a well, capitalist I mean, as cap a I mean, this is okay. So, I mean, there's a longer conversation here, but I think that capitalism is a very dynamic, it's probably the most uh, don't hold me to this, uh, but it is the most dynamic mode of production ever to have existed in history, precisely because of the fact that it can operate at different historical movements and geographically can operate according to various different cultural logics. And the main driving thing for capitalism, of course, is constant pursuit of profit. And its whole goal is to try to leap over, it requires, but also tries to leap over barriers that prohibit the continued production of profit, not just surplus value, but as you said before, of profit. It doesn't matter to produce a lot of surplus value, that has to be realized in the market. So whenever capital sort of experiences a moment when it can't realize profit, uh, the translation of surplus value back into profit, it tends to find some kind of ideological cultural formation that allows it to again, get over those barriers. And I think that- um, So that's how you explain the movement from modernist culture to what you call postmodernist culture I, yeah absolutely i would say that definitely and i think that a good way to describe it would be so in modern culture modern culture would you could say you know would be the the culture of you know the 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 father who says no if i'm going to use like a, a typical example that some of the listeners or viewers might know the father who says no, the culture of prohibition and postmodern capitalism is the culture of free enjoyment, right? So, you know, the guilt feeling of not being able to constantly enjoy. And I think that it creates the appearance that there's no longer a form of prohibition. But there's a difficulty here because as we we just finished talking about how enjoyment is involved in transgression. So if we don't have that lim that level of prohibition that we can transgress, then that creates a problem for our enjoyment. So I think that postmodern, and this is where I disagree with Deleuze and Guattari when they say that, when they talk about um, the schizo is what's being produced in, you know, they don't call it postmodern yet, but in that the schizophrenic is what's being produced. And I actually think that the, the, the form of the subject that's appropriate for thinking 
the postmodern end of prohibition is the perverse subject. Right. And I think that there is a dimension of because we require their limit to transgress as part of our enjoyment, we start to put in place, um, you know, other figures, other characters that yeah. are the the thing that we have to get over, the authority. We have. I think that's a lot of what Trumpism. Right, I, I agree. For instance, I think that's a lot of what you know forms of extremist fundamentalism are. Yeah. Right, that there's yeah. no real encounter with the the limits to not only enjoyment but also the material limitations that produce desperation, um, um, disparity, depression. I think that in you know war ravaged and poverty ravaged places that you know uh, if you don't have a material you know form that can you can that you can you know, a project that you can build or that it's failed, you, 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 tr you know, you put in place, you know, some figure that, you know, is you're, you're trying to get past, right? Whether it's, I don't know, like, you know, um, the, the anti-Semitic figure of the Jew or the, uh, you know, the social justice warrior or whoever. So I right. think that this is the form that, that, it, or the that university it kind of, professor, <laughs> sorry, or, or the, the university <laughs> professor, right? No, 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 don't worry. I'm like strict authoritarian in all of my classes. No, 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 no. But I mean, we're the new, we're the new figure, we're the new oh. barrier, the new obstacle. I mean, I think Trump is the first one to really single out the university professor, the politically correct university professor as the, I mean, you know. I mean, it Mal did too, <laughs> but, but I mean, I mean, in the, of the, uh, the first real. You want to talk about Mao and the cultural revolution, how much time do you have? I but, <laughs> no, I, I, no, your point is well taken. I mean, yeah, we see that in all the, you know, the crap about cultural Marxism or, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, these are various, you know, incarnations of the way that I think about the form of the perverse subjectivity and postmodern capitalism. I think that for what we see then, you know, social media kind of demonstrates, though, again, is this form that it's a it's a constitution of the symbolic or, or the big other in a way. But again, we, we, disav we there's a, a tendency to disavow and I guess the cynicism. Okay, so I, I think I, I, I finally, after this long process, got, got back, yourself into the answer. Good. I, I got it. I got the answer. No, I remember what I was saying. So I think that, um, um, the and, and, and I'm drawing actually. I, I, I'm reminding myself now. I'm drawing quite a bit on one. I think your, one of my favorite of your books on film is you're out of time. And I think there, where you're talking about this difference between the logic of desire and drive, is actually some of the best writing you've done on this topic. And there's a part where you're talking about cynicism here as the, you know, knowing that the object is impossible, but nevertheless, you keep going on and pursuing it. You get that in consumer culture, for instance. I know that no matter, you know, no matter how many, um, um, you know, things I go and buy at the bookstore, I'm never gonna find the book that I, that I truly want, right? So I know this, but nevertheless, like, you know, I, I keep doing it, right? right? And I think that that's something that social media has actually done. So the form of social media has actually done for the, the form of the internet. And this is another reason why I think about it in terms of a structuralism, because if you think of the internet as this open space, yeah. you know, where it's a sea of abundance, where you can, you know, get all information, you can have all communication, you can do whatever, right? I think that, what the commodification, or I should say the second commodification of the internet, because as we know, the internet was produced, you know, through public funding, through the military, but then was commodified with the emergence of the World Wide Web. But then the, the platformification or Web 2.0, you know, brought a new structure back to the space of the internet. So Google is a good example here, right? So you can find anything you want, but then Google comes along and it helps you with the search function. Right. So there's this sense, you know, I can search whatever I want or anybody who's done. You know, I when I I lived in Japan for a year and there were moments that I, like all all night I, when Wikipedia was becoming popular, I'd start reading something on Wikipedia and that would link me to the next article. Right, and I'm right. like, I'm looking for the answer. When am I going to find like, And you just keep going and going and going and going and going. And you just kind of, you know, you know, I know that I'll never get it. I don't have so the that's whole... the cynicism. That makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I wanna, I wanna it's kind of. Very long. No, no, that that I, that works a lot. That work. I, that makes total sense to me. Um, so there's one section though that didn't make sense to me. So you and 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 I just would. I just think I didn't quite get it because I don't. I never understood exactly how this works. So you talk about what you call swiping logic. Yeah, and, you know this like uh, I guess what is it like Tinder or something Tinder. like 
grinder. Which I've never used. I, I did meet my wife through internet dating, but it was way before the app. This is for Tinder. Okay. Uh, yeah, I never, I never used it either, but I, I'm not against, obviously. Um, but then you compare it to sexual difference. And I wonder, can you just unpack that for me? Like I didn't, I just, it wasn't clear to me what the, wh how, what was coming out of that comparison. Okay. This is okay. So it, it's, it's a very long section and I don't yeah. want to go too far into it, but okay. the, to reduce it somewhat, I think that if we look at, and again, I, I'm very much influenced here by uh, John Kopchak's brilliant Sex and the Euthanasia of uh, Reason, and also uh, Zupanchich's recent What is Sex, and also some of the stuff that Slavoj has written on the logics of sexuation, apart from, of course, Lacan's own um, discussions of it uh, in Seminar 20 and so forth. But I think that at it's very basic, and maybe you'll disagree with my interpretation, mm -hmm. but at the very basic level, I think that both the feminine and the masculine logics relate to the, the phallic signifier in some way. And I right. think that when we look at the logics of sexuation, they relate to the signifier they're either in the form of an affirmation or in the form of a negation. Mm -hmm. So part of the what I'm trying to think about here, and I guess still for me too, it's a way of understanding the 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 initial formation of subjectivity um, if we read it through the through through Lacan and all it, and this also ties into the, the 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 formation of the fantasy the fundamental fantasy the formation of the other pussy as the original lost object the formation of the subject's relation to the big other and I think that a lot of it has to do with this moment of initial fundamental force choice where we initially decide do I do I identify with the 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 the, the gaze of the of the parent, right? The gaze of the other, and do I choose the identity the that they have chosen for me? Do I choose this on my own freely? Um, but in that moment of choice, at the same time, I'm negating all the other possible choices. That and I think that that negation, that foundational negation of all the other possible choices, is one of the ways to think about the formation of fantasy and the objets, this initial lost object. So mm -hmm. that the formation of subjectivity is this initial fundamental moment of affirmation and negation that occurs simultaneously. I think that every every choice, every affirmed choice, is simultaneously the negation of a choice. And I think that then secondarily plays a role and you know we can get into long discussions about the orders here right but then that also relates to um the the identification with a masculine or a feminine logic do we affirm the 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 phallic signifier as the signifier of castration or do we negate it but we still relate to it in the form of the negation right so I, i'm kind of thinking about it uh uh in that way but you just kind of reminded me something and i and I, every time I go back to this part now, I think that I'm far too Maoist in or even, you know, because what I talk about is there's always the affirmation negation, but there's never negation of the. Right. Right. So, I mean, you know, when when Mao says, you know, there's no such thing as negation of the negation that, of right. course, Alistair builds on, of course, you know, famously Stalin doesn't include that in his dialectical materialism. So I think that there's a, a deeper dimension that I that I now want to, to bring out in this discussion of the affirmation and the negation. But I think that in the context of the swiping logic, it would be this moment of where I finally say, I don't need Tinder anymore. Like I've affirmed my limit in the choice of the of, of the partner. And I think that I mean, that's, uh, you know, not something that I think is necessarily attached to the reading of social media, but it's a way to use social media as a way of understanding the logics of emancipation. Okay, so, so for you, like the logic of Tin, so for you, it's just the very divide itself that that Tinder creates through the swipe, that 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 the necessity of the negation that then is obscured in the swipe. Is that the point? Is that the point? So you like, so you miss the way in which you're actually relying on what you've negated in order to. Pick yeah. your object. Yeah. Yeah. I also think that that's a good. It's it's a useful um, 
at the level of the interface, right? The interface of the swipe right, swipe left. I think it's doing a couple of other things. I mean, it's a useful way of understanding the logic of desire more generally, and this, you know, the rela the subjective relation of affirmation and negation of choice. I think it also is a, a useful way for thinking about the 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 construction of algorithm itself at the very basic level of the the, the fact that coding is is written through binary binary logic of one and zero. And I think that often when we talk about binary, for instance, the gender binary, we're talking about two positive terms of masculine right. feminine, so, right. or feminine, sorry, that was a big slip, of masculine and feminine. But I think that what we really should be talking about when we're looking at binary and binary opposition is not the op opposition of two positive terms, but of the affirmation of a positive term and then the negation of that term. And I think if we look at the structure of the society generally we still have we still can't think of it in binary terms and this goes back to the rethinking this idea of structuralism if we think you know as you know Derrida for instance talks about the formation of the you know difference as the deferment of the of the of the binary or right but there's always a dominant term within the binary I think that the 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 what would you call it the the secondary term in the binary is really a uh, a representation of all of those various forms of negation of the fundamental of the transcendental signified right, right? right. so that it's really not just masculine feminine but it's masculine non-masculine for well that's why and i think that's right and i think that's why for instance slavoj will say the subject is feminine in its constitution right because the the positive the swipe right if you will like that position it always believes it really has something right and that's the error i think so so that's the point right so that the the swiping actually is a is is it almost your point is it almost functions ideologically right because it hides the way in which there has to be a negation involved in the in the difference and so if you read swiping through sexual difference then the negation becomes evident that's that's your point right that is a good way i think that's a good way uh, 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 of putting it together um i think that but the other thing too is that you can see very much in, in the fact that you can only swipe left or right that you can you can see in which the way that the the form is sort of representative of the ideological form overall insofar as you you start to learn that you can never have all of the choices isn't like the, the big fantasy that you don't have to choose that you can you can get all you know I mean I, I you know I, I only know this through you know, secondary information but you amass all of like the set of the possible suitors or whatever you want to call them i i i feel like i'm like such an old person in calling it that. <laughs> Isn't that the fact, like you could have all of the those things but then at the same time you have to negate all those things so i think that what the form of the swipe logic shows is the same is, is the very form of ideology and the fact that you are always affirming something and negating all the other possibilities yeah that's really good i like i, I like that as an end point actually because that's i mean that seems like the whole book is really it seems to me about this about a, a form of ideological ideology critique in terms of, and, and addressing the way in which that needs to be brought to bear on social media especially right like a, a new and i think you're right to, i like this term new structuralism as a way to to insert subjectivity into the equation and, the, and thus kind of make the analysis I mean, it makes it more politically efficacious, I think, because I think if the subjectivity, if subjectivity is written out, then what, and I think this is a problem with Levi-Strauss and Saussure and the whole, that whole structuralist movement, there seems to be no position for any political activity, political agency at all, right? Yeah, and I would and I would add that I would add to Althusser too because yeah, I, right, right, when right. you look at Althusser, I mean, what is the? I mean, I don't I mean it may I, I can go as far as agreeing that maybe history is a process without subject or goal, but I absolutely cannot imagine emancipation without subject or goal. Even if the goal is there as a as a a, a, um, a signpost, right? As a as a way to measure, you know, the success or failure of the movement. And I cannot imagine uh, uh, 
uh, a Marxist theory that still doesn't have something like communism or the proletariat, you can change the term if you want to because of various historical right. conditions. But subject and goal, I think, even, and this goes back to, you know, that move from Kant to Hegel, that subject and goal to me is still very much the way to think about the 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 the, the goalposts of the of the structure that you you know you posit the presuppositions yep. right and that's the basis against which you have to think about you know everything that you measure uh, uh, against it right? right or if you think you know you know in 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 critique of judgment so the the moment of the the heuristic of the sublime and the teleology right that, that i think is misattributed to hegel i mean i, I this is going to be this is far and probably don't have time to talk about it but i i wanted to ask you at some point what you think about the the position of the the section on teleology it, how it's not in the section on the absolute idea of the logic that it kind of comes in that middle moment and don't right. we have to always think about you know that there's there's purpose but only to realize that it's that it's you know it's never achieved which is why Absolutely. i think in some ways dystopia dystopia is more appropriate than utopia because it's only in the realization of the failure that is to come that we can think right. about the present right right so i think that's absolutely true i think that's absolutely hegel's position that that it's own that, that there is always purpose articulated through its failure right so yeah. i think that that to the failure to get it again i think this it's really the importance of not or retroactivity in, in his thought and in what you're talking about. And isn't, so, isn't dystopia dystopia the perfect form of Nagrigalite, yeah. but from the imagined position of the future to the present? Right, right, right. I agree. I agree. And, and and that's why I think it's such a I think that's why people are so drawn to dystopias and they're not drawn to utopias, right? <laughs> Utopia is boring. Like even Thomas More, it's boring, right? So I think that's a really that's a good nice point to end on. Thanks so much, Matt. I really, it was great. Thanks so much for having me, Todd. This was great. Sure. Take care.